Ira, for the uh, introduction. I'd like to um, thank Klaus Siebenbrock for the kind invitation to this excellent meeting. Ladies and gentlemen, we have heard a lot about um, cartilage damage and progression of disease. Um, and I want to give another view on this topic. Um, we have the clinical problem that FAI morphology is very common. We have still a limited sensitivity in the MRI for chondral lesions, and we don't know what is the best time for surgery. On the other hand, we know that the results of hip atroscopy are depending on age, but also especially on the cartilage damage. And in population-based studies, we find a quite high conversion rate to total hip atroscopy, especially if cartilage damage is pronounced. So the aim of my study was, uh, of our study was to look at clinical and radiographic risk factors that predict higher grade cartilage damage in patients with symptomatic FAI. So it was a cohort study, cross-sectional study, 320 consecutive cases uh, were included with uh, patients who had hip atroscopy for FAI. All comorbidities uh, were excluded from uh, DDH, uh, intra-articular comorbidities um, like chondromatosis, uh, previous hip, su hip surgery, inflammatory disease, uh, previous trauma and previous surgeries. Outcome was correlated to um, the cartilage damage um, classified from the back score, you've heard about that um, already in also Moritz Tanner's talk, and was also classified with the outer bridge score. And we also looked at the size of the cartilage damage, and we used a very simple parameter. We looked at the width between the chondrolabral junction and the fossa, and classified this in different sizes below 0.5 centimeters and over 2 centimeters of width. After applying the inclusion-exclusion criteria, there were 193 hips in 170 patients, aged 34 years, which were assessed for statistical analysis. We find out, like other studies, that age is a highly significant predictor of higher grade and larger cartilage damage, with an odds ratio of 1.05 for every year of age. So this was confirmed and or confirmed previous studies. Interestingly, duration of symptoms and pain was not a significant predictor in our study. That's somehow conflicting in the uh, literature that is published, um, especially when you look at the results of hypotroscopy that tend to be better in patients who have early surgery, um, but it did not correlate the duration with the severity of cartilage damage, neither the size or the grade of cartilage damage. Male gender was a risk factor for higher grade cartilage damage. Um, with an odds ratio of 5. And uh, clinical symptoms like the internal rotation in 90 degree of flexion were also a risk factor of higher grade and larger cartilage damage with better internal re rotation reducing the odds ratio for cartilage damage. One single um, parameter that showed a high odds ratio of 4.5 um, for higher grade cartilage damages was pistol grip deformity and that was um, more or less um, transferable to all other parameters of chem type deformity. The horizontal growth plate sign or extended epiphysis had an odds ratio of 3.8 for higher grade cartilage damage and also of 3 for larger cartilage damages. And um, that's one parameter that I find very useful in daily clinical medicine. That's the morphology of the chem type deformity. And we classified four different types no chem deformity then an aspherical head where the bump starts at the head already. Um, number two was a lack of offset at the head neck junction, still a pathologic alpha angle, um, but no real bump. And uh, grade three was an offset at the head neck junction, but the bump at the femoral neck. And the only one that really had a high odds ratio for higher grade and larger cartilage damage was uh, the type one with the aspherical femoral head. So. Um, on the first look at, at the x-ray, um, that gives you already an information if the patient is at higher risk for higher grade cartilage damage. Of course, the alpha angle was significantly, significantly correlated to higher grade and larger cartilage damages as published in earlier studies. And when you look at all the parameters on the femoral side um, and clinical parameters, you can find out that every parameter that describes the offset be between the head and the femoral neck is highly significant correlated to a higher risk of higher grade and larger cartilage damage, whereas the femoral parameters um, that are result from pincer-type deformities 
um, or impingement itself, like herniation pits, linear indentation sign, reactive thickening of the anterior cortex of the femoral neck, or the CCD angle, did not correlate to a higher risk of uh, to a risk of higher grade cartilage damage. I have to uh, comment that, of course, hip dysplasia patients were excluded in this cohort. That's why the CCD angle or the uh, also the acetabular parameters excluded very pathologic um, dysplastic um, acetabular. When we look at the acetabular side, um, we did not find a significant correlation between the radiographic parameters, pincer type impingement, like the crossover sign, and higher grade cartilage damage. The ischial spine sign did not correlate with higher grade cartilage damage, as well as the acetabular index, the lateral center edge angle, um, Again, dysplastic patients had been excluded. Uh, the posterior wall sign, acetabular death, coxa profunda or acetabular, and um, of note, of course, the tennis grade of osteoarthritis, highly um, predicted uh, higher grade and larger cartilage damage. What is interesting, unfortunately, we only have um, um, the information of 20 patients, but we follow up on that, is pain during the first steps of the sitting when running in pain uh, showed a high odds ratio that was not statistically significant, but uh, since I think the reason was that we just had it available for only a small number of patients. So let me conclude. The predictors of larger and higher grade cartilage damage on the acetabular side in femoral acetabular impingement syndrome were higher age, male gender, and reduced internal rotation, um, and especially the male gender, correlated with CAM um, parameters of the femur, which all showed a highly, significant, uh, highly significantly predicted higher grade cartilage damage, whereas the acetabular uh, parameters did not correlate with higher grade or larger cartilage damage. If we know this, of course, we, we want to know what are the treatment options that we have for the cartilage defects in the acetabulum. And um, this is a study published from the Danish Hip Arthroscopy Registry, which confirms data that we know from, from all the studies that patients with FII have a high rate of cartilage damage, grade 2 or, more, uh, or higher in 88% of patients. And when you look at the treatment that was done in the Danish Hip um, Arthroscopy Register, then you see that um, in nearly all patients, there was only done debridement of the cartilage and nothing else, apart from bony correction of the FII deformity, but uh, nearly no specific um, cartilage treatment was done, and the rate of microfracture in the acetabulum was very small. So what arthroscopic treatment options do we have? We have a lot of arthroscopic treatment options. When we look to other joints, we have bone marrow stimulating techniques and we have the, the uh, techniques of transplantation. And uh, apart from the oats, the osteochondral um, um, allograft transplantation, uh, every uh, technique can also be applied arthroscopically from abrasion, arthroplasty, microfracture, um, amic techniques, with uh, trans uh, chondrocyte transplantation with and without mat matrices. Um, that's why we looked at a, um, a cohort um, that, that we did. We included a very uh, well-defined um, patient collective with uh, only CAM-type deformity patients with a cartilage damage between 2 and 5 square centimeters uh, with a higher grade uh, cartilage damage grade 3 or 4, and excluded any patient who had additional treatment of the acetabular rim uh, with labrum repair and other co-pathologies to really focus on this CAM type um, cohort. And there were uh, two different groups. One group was abrasion, that means um, with a caret to go over the subchondral um, bone until we have this punctual bleeding like we see it here that can be easily done. And the, in the other group, in the group one, it was combined with a matrix of hyaluronic acid. In the other group, it was just this abrasion. Um, we looked at the IHOT-12 and we looked at the success rate which was defined by the patients reaching the patient acceptable symptom state which has been uh, published as being 59.5 uh, uh, points on the IHOT-12 um, that gives the patients a result that is acceptable for the symptoms. The follow-up is planned for two years, um, and I uh, want to show you how this works. So here we see the typical cartilage damage um, in FAI. The labrum looks okay. 
um, and then the cartilage was debrided. And in this case, that's an older case that also did microfracture um, in the cohort. I, I stopped with this um, when we have very nice punctual bleeding that you usually can achieve without these big holes that you produce in microfracture. And um, then this is covered with the uh, without water, it's covered with the hyaluronic membrane and fixed with uh, free brain glue, and that's how it looks like uh, when the defect is filled. And I want to show you some preliminary results. Um, uh, this is a, the example of one case that had a chondromatosis that was not part from the study, but uh, we did a surgical hip dislocation and had a second look arthroscopy, and that's how the membrane looked after one year when the screws were removed. So I think macroscopically a very nice result. Uh, we had improvement in both groups. Um, we have a very high pass score rate um, in, the, in the group with the membrane. I do not show um, statistical an analysis since these are preliminary results, but that's one problem that we have with all the studies on specific cartilage therapy, uh, that they are usually um, in a, with a smaller patient collective uh, and with a short follow-up, that's what we have so far. One of the largest studies is from uh, Fontana, who compared amic versus microfracture, and he could show that uh, there is a group difference after two years um, in the larger defects over four square centimeters in favor of the amic technique compared to microfracture. Um, that's one of the uh, high-quality studies, higher-quality studies that are available with a five-year follow-up. Um, but still, there is only insufficient data to um, to be in favor or, of or against any um, any um, cell-based um, reconstruction techniques for cartilage defects. The systematic reviews that we have um, all include mainly level four stu studies, um, with uh, Macy and Amic coming from single institutions, um, and also when you, when you look at the data. Um, you find comparable results, but often with different defect sizes of the enrolled um, techniques with microfracture being used for the smaller defects, 149 compared to uh, autologous chondrocyte transplantation. Those, these studies are not really comparable. That's why I have to conclude. We know certain predictors for a larger and higher grade cartilage damage like um, especially higher age, limited internal rotation, and these typical CAM-type morphologies with uh, a very proximal bump at the femoral head being one of the qualitative, um, highly significant risk factors. We have a lot of uh, treatment options. Microfracture has approximately 90% success rate with the results declining after one year. That's what the studies also show. There are cell-based therapies available um, with promising results in larger defects um, and midterm outcome, outcome after year two. But of course, we need high-quality studies with appropriate follow-up um, to really be able to give evidence-based recommendations for cartilage treatments. Thank you.